Hey guys, welcome to the first video for chapter 17, actually the first video for Global 2, uh, and we're going to be talking about the Enlightenment in this chapter. Uh, now before we get into the individual beliefs and people of the Enlightenment, it's important to have a general understanding of what the word means, right? So what was the Enlightenment? The definition of the word is a state of being enlightened, right? If you just look it up in the dictionary, lowercase e, not capital E, right? The capital E up here, that signifies that we're talking about the movement. Get that out of there. Okay. Um, you know, but the word enlightened, it, it could mean free from ignorance or having a full understanding of a situation, right? In Hinduism and Buddhism, we talked about it, about reaching this ultimate state of enlightenment, about achieving one with the universe. So it could mean that you're really, really smart or really, really no knowledgeable about a uh, situation. And because of this definition, philosophers and historians use the word to describe a European intellectual movement in the 17th and 18th centuries. Now, remember, when we're talking about centuries, we subtract a number from it. So 17 17th century is the 1600s. 18th century is the 1700s, right? We're in the 2000s, but we're in the 21st century. Now, it came after other movements of change, such as the Renaissance and the Scientific Revolution, right? With the Renaissance, it's big about paintings like the Mona Lisa. Scientific Revolution was things like the you know, use of telescope and that the sun was the center of the universe and so forth. Now, rather than art and science, though, the Enlightenment focused more on society and government, you know, about how we interacted with each other and especially how we interacted with our government. Um, there was an awful lot of influence, though, uh, from these earlier movements. The scientific revolution gave rise to the idea of natural laws. Now, natural laws are rules that you can discover through reason or using your mind. You know, not necessarily just kind of, you know, faith and religion and so forth. Examples of natural laws are gravity, magnetism, things of that nature. Now, if reason could be used to figure out the laws of nature, then... Um, Enlightenment philosophers uh, kind of figured out that you could use them to figure out how society and government works as well. Now, another big idea is that government gets their power from the people. We call this consent of the governed. Now, throughout human history, it was believed that kings and emperors got their power from God or gods. We call this divine right. Right? God made me king, and that means I'm better than you, and if you don't listen to me, God is going to be very angry. Now, this started to change during this time period. Um, you know, Philosophers claim that governments ruled through the power they got from the people, not from God. Now, this brought back an interest in a government that first came about in ancient Greece known as democracy. Now, democracy, we remember, is ruled by the people. Let me just move me out of the way here. Demos, the people, Kratos, to rule, right? Rule by the people. It's literally what it means. Now, the idea of it only works if the people actually have power in the government. And that comes about with the idea of consent of the governed. You know, they don't just have to blindly follow their leaders because they were told that God chose them uh, to be in charge. Now, the Enlightenment was defined by many ideas, but it's probably best remembered by uh, uh, the key people, right? These philosophs. Philosoph is just a fancy word for philosopher. Uh, we first learned about philosophers in ancient Greece with uh, guys like Socrates and Aristotle. They're basically guys who think about the world and come up with theories as to how everything works. Doesn't sound terribly exciting, but some of these guys came up with some very, very important concepts that we have in America today. Now, the first person we're going to be looking at is John Locke. John Locke was an Englishman in the 1600s, and he was big into the idea of natural rights. Natural rights, according to Locke, are the rights that all humans receive at birth, as opposed to those that you get from government. And the main natural rights that Locke described were life, liberty, and property. Right? He also discussed a right to overthrow the government if uh, those rights are violated. Now, Excuse me. Years after they were published, Locke's writings were used as the basis for the Declaration of Independence. All right, so let's look at some of the text of it here. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed with their creator with certain unalienable rights. Okay, And endowed by their creator. That's a fancy word for saying God. All right? God gave us these unalienable rights. Unalienable means you can't take them away from us. And among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Right? So he kind of copied Locke here. He just changed property to the pursuit of happiness. Also, whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, meaning when a government is not protecting those natural rights, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it. It meaning government. And abolish means get rid of. 
All right, so it says we have a right to overthrow the government if the government violates our rights. So Locke kind of set the foundation for these ideas that Jefferson ran with that really became the basis uh, for the United States of America. Now, Locke wasn't the only enlightened philosopher who would influence the creation of the U.S. Let me just get rid of all this stuff here. Okay. Uh, you also had this guy, Baron de Montesquieu. Uh, he believed that government should be divided into different branches. Right? Now, in the U.S., we have our three basic branches, legislative, executive, and judicial. Right? Legislative, Congress, executive, the president, judicial, the Supreme Court at the highest levels. Uh, and he also advocated that these branches be separated, right? that they don't overlap too much. Uh, and then it, what this creates is a system known as checks and balances. All right, so that each gov each branch of government has some power over the other, right? Whether it be, say, the appointment of a Supreme Court justice, right? That's obviously within the judicial branch, the Supreme Court, but he's nominated or she is nominated by the president, the executive branch, but must be confirmed by the Senate in the legislative branch. Similarly, if the legislative branch Congress wants to pass a bill, it has to be uh, signed into law by the executive branch. And if the executive branch doesn't like it, the president can veto it. Also, the judicial branch could determine that the law is unconstitutional. Right? So there are all sorts of uh, systems in place to make sure that one branch doesn't get too powerful. All right, two other guys to talk about here. One, Voltaire. Voltaire was a French writer, and he was a staunch supporter of free speech. You know, he truly believed in what this illustration is saying, that freedom of speech should have no limits. He was famous as saying, you know, I'm kind of, uh, you know, not saying it verbatim, this quote, but, you know, even though I hate what you have to say, I will defend to the death your right to say it. You know, he says no speech should be limited. Now, that obviously is up for debate about whether you should have some limitations on free speech, but still... You know, Voltaire was a firm, firm supporter of that. Also of freedoms of other stuff. You know, it's a freedom of religion and that government shouldn't have any type of uh, say into how you live your life. Um, one last guy, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Now, he was another French writer, as you can tell by the name. And he wrote that society is what he called a social contract. Right? Now, a contract is an agreement. You know, you sign a contract when you buy a car, when you buy a house and so forth. And most contracts that we deal with are in writing. Not all of them, though. A social contract is an unwritten agreement that citizens enter with their government. Now, as I said, it's not expressly written, but we have an agreement with our government that we will give up certain freedoms in return for protections and stability. Right? We give up our right to basically do whatever we want. You know, we can't just kind of live everything. We have certain restrictions. That's what laws and rules are about. But in return for that, we get stability. We don't have to live by the laws of nature, the survival of the fittest. Governments provide support systems for us. You know, police officers, firemen, even things such as sanitation pickup, right? We don't have to worry about that stuff. But in return, we got to listen to laws. We have to pay our taxes, things of that nature. Okay, so that's a social contract that we uh, that we enter into. One other minor thing, he was he was uh, big into believing that the goods of the many outweigh individual needs. That we need to think as a community. That we need to think as a society, as opposed to worrying about ourselves as individuals. Okay, so that's just a uh, kind of basic introduction to what the Enlightenment is and some of the main philosophs. And then in the next video, we're going to be talking about how it spread into other areas.